We are humans, we are animals, we crave the ability to be we. I know it's called me and it's we and these might have sounded differently. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a disco now? Yeah, it's it's oh. an after party, so it's uh, now we go with the yeah. flash. My goal in life is to be a laptop sticker. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and despite the best ministrations of your wife, you still look ugly. <laughs> it's a great honor, Mr. Jaffe. It's always nice to be with you. I'm so happy to be with you. Um, I'm honored. Thanks for doing this, too. It's a real service to the community. Thank you for doing this, um, Joseph, for doing Corona TV in general. And um, it's your gift to the universe, and it's appreciated. Very human, and I like that. Look at you! You I are mean, insane! How did I do that? You're how insane! Did I do that? You're insane! <laughs> how can I not smile when I, when I watch, uh, in the most self-deprecating fashion uh, imaginable, uh, how much joy this show gives me, and if I can give you joy through the show, um, then I've done my part. Welcome, everybody. It is Sunday, and it is the Sunday of Memorial Day. We are going to inject some levity and some fun and some hope and optimism, but we're also going to uh, accept and, and, and acknowledge the uh, solemnity of the weekend of Memorial Day, um, and, of course, the fact that we are approaching 100,000 people that have uh, sadly and tragically lost their lives during this uh, coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic. So just a few little thank yous. I want to thank uh, Frank uh, Frank Peruna, who is watching at the moment. That's his original track. Frank, it is a beautiful track. It is a winner. Uh, it deserves to climb the charts. And I'm going to continue to promote you. Uh, and it was so awesome having you uh, on the show. I know Millie Garfield is watching. Shout out to Millie Garfield in Massachusetts, close to Newton, uh, Massachusetts, where, of course, Defending Jacob uh, was set as well. Hello to uh, Michelle Stearns. There you guys are, just acknowledging all of you. Uh, really appreciate you guys following the show um, as well. So it is a great show today. Uh, I am privileged to have uh, Mark, Mark Bombach, who created, who wrote, uh, who produced the um, miniseries, the TV miniseries adaptation of the book by the same name, uh, Defending Jacob. And we're going to get into that in a moment. And I'm going to probably bring him on as soon uh, as I possibly can, uh, because, you know, you, you don't really want to see me, do you? Even though I dressed up for you, I dressed up for him and, and you guys as well. Um, and, and no, I'm not wearing pants, but I mean, it's an old joke and it's true or whatever. Let's just get into it. So it is National Lucky Penny Day. Uh, we need all the luck we can get. So hopefully you're going to find luck. You're going to find that needle in the haystack or find, you know, that moment that, that inspires you and brings a smile to your face. Uh, unfortunately, fat blogging didn't go so well for me uh, this week. Um, for those of you that are new to the show, every week I post my weight. Um, overall, I've lost, so from 200.7 pounds, unfortunately, this morning, I was 195.5, so I put on two pounds and change. I am not uh, upset about it. I'm not depressed about it. Uh, it's probably water. It's definitely, it's definitely alcohol, there's no doubt. It's also this magnificent meal that I had last night, homemade by my wife and my daughter. We had sushi, we had beautiful poke bowls with tuna and salmon, and I ate it all up. Um, but I'm training, I'm running. And you know, May 2018, two years ago, two years ago, uh, was the last time that I'd run this much in a month. So here I am two years later, um, I'm going to hit probably 50 miles this month. And, and hopefully, there's a little bit of, uh, of muscle replacing uh, the nice Yiddish word of schmaltz uh, on my body. Muscle weighs more than schmaltz. Um, so there you go. So next, next week's interviews, I think you know some of the people, but just a little bit of update. Dave Delaney has kindly agreed to do Corona cocktails. It's five o'clock somewhere. It will be five o'clock here, and we will drink, and we will, uh, we will laugh, no doubt. Um, and I wasn't going to do a show tomorrow, but something changed. I actually ended up uh, interviewing a freshman and a sophomore at Vanderbilt University. They put a, a, a song together. I, I interviewed them, and it's the first time that I will do a pre recorded episode of Corona TV. Why is that important? It's important uh, because at some point I'm going to need to figure out 
how often I do the show and when I do the show and how I'm going to do the show when I'm traveling uh, again. A whole bunch of birthdays and I'll just, you know, kind of show your, your beautiful name on the screen. Those were the birthdays, Facebook and LinkedIn birthdays. Yesterday, today, just a few uh, uh, shout outs, Martine, Breskel Trope, uh, my brother from another mother, Mitch Joel, Linda Stone, uh, all the way on uh, Facebook. And then, of course, uh, my LinkedIn friends as well. Hopefully, you guys are socially distancing with friends uh, or having a barbecue over Memorial Day weekend uh, and keeping your spirits up. Um, it is tough, right? I mean, it is tough to recognize today the, uh, the, the front page of the New York Times. It says U.S. deaths near 100,000 and in Cult I can't even pronounce that, you, you know what I mean, an incalculable loss, an incalculable loss. Um, it, it was this page and another three pages as well. Uh, and I think it's important, you know, to show this on full screen. Um, four pages like this that just represents 1%, just 1% of the people that have perished. Think about that. Four pages but only 1%. It is important for us to be able to acknowledge and for us to be able to not just remember them, not just remember the people that have come before them and the people that have served our country and fallen for our country uh, on Memorial Day, but indeed all of the people that have paid the ultimate price um, right now. And then the final thing that I want to do today with you is, is start a new segment. Uh, I call it the seated soliloquy. Uh, mainly because I'm seated right now. Uh, and it's a little bit of a monologue. It's something um, to share with you my thoughts uh, as succinct as I possibly can. Um, and uh, I'm going to do that now. And if you'll indulge me, um, I hope uh, you enjoy uh, the seated soliloquy. This is all about uh, vulnerability. We're living through a time where it doesn't pay to be opaque, to build walls around us. Life is too short for all the BS and bravado that we've spent decades investing our time, effort, and energy against. We're vulnerable now more than ever. The planet has been telling us this for the longest time and we chose not to listen. Now Mother Nature has extended the middle finger while she heals and continues to heal. Even the sun is in on the act. Now, fun fact, the last time the sun gave off this little energy, we had an ice age, for real and not the movie. Being vulnerable is not for everyone. I see and sense how people recoil into their unhappy place of discomfort when anyone reveals something about themselves that comes across as weak, uncertain, or needy. It seems people can't deal with real emotion. They're closed off and guarded, and so the only thing they can do is disappear into what I call the black hole. It's a failing of our business and social culture, and a big part of the reason why so many businesses, uh, businesses today are built to suck. Well, I have news for you and news for them. I'm not going back to the old way. I'm going to try and be even more transparent, more direct, more, well, honest. And if you can't deal with it, it's too bad. Maybe, just maybe, you'll respond commensurately by revealing something about yourself that people might not have known. And guess what? We kind of knew it already. You know how? Because you're human. It's the kind of cathartic remedy that will heal the human race. People are not used to asking others for help, but this needs to change and it needs to change today. So let's begin today. Well, that is the soliloquy and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you do, let me know in the comments contact me, I'll do more of that for you. But you didn't come here today to hear about soliloquies from Joseph Jaffe. No, no, you came uh, to hear about um, and hear from Mr. Mark Bombeck. And his credentials are uh, quite impressive. I would like to take the opportunity to read them to you. Mark Bombeck is the creator, executive producer, and writer of the Apple TV Plus limited series, Defending Jacob. His screenwriting credits include The Art of Racing in the Rain, War for the Planet of the Apes, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, Insurgent, The Wolverine, Total Recall, Unstoppable, Live Free or Die Hard, Deception, Race to Witch Mountain and Godsend. 
Bombax served as, as an executive producer on War for the Planet of the Apes and Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, as well as the forthcoming The United States versus Billy Holiday. In addition, he has advised at the Sundance Institute's New Frontier Story Lab and has taught screenwriting at his alma mater, Wesleyan University. He lives in New York with his wife and four children. Please join me in welcoming Mark Bombeck. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Joseph. It's a pleasure to be here. So, so far, I would say uh, on a technical uh, difficulty level, I've pushed myself to the limit, and I think I've probably only stuffed up three times. So hopefully you didn't notice. <laughs> I'm sure you would have. No, I'm just trying to wrap my head around the disparity between what I'm wearing and what you're wearing, and I apologize to your audience for looking so schlubby. I did not realize you would be dressed so nicely. Oh, I can, you know, I can change it. I can, I, as quickly as I can, I'll Thank take you. the tie, I'll take the tie off. This might, the, this might actually be the first time I've worn a tie since my bar mitzvah. So, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll throw, we'll throw that away. Um, we're going to talk obviously about defending Jacob. And I have to tell you just a few things first. One is, uh, I, I mean, I'm a binge eater, uh, evidently based on the sushi that I ate <laughs> and my weight, but I'm not really a binge watcher, and yet uh, I watched four episodes of Defending Jacob back to back to back to back. It's, I swear to you, I'm not, I'm not lying. It's the first time I've actually gone four episodes deep, um, and I'm loving it, and, and I'm up to date, uh, and I won't be asking for any spoilers because, of course, there is a book if I really wanted one. Um, but I'm ready. I'm ready for the, final, for the final episode, which airs on Friday and uh, perfect timing of this of this conversation. Great, yeah, well, I will say, even those who've read the book, uh, they might have a sense of what the ending will be, but in fact, it's a, it's a bit different than what's in the book. So even people who, um, who are familiar with the basic trajectory of the plot, hopefully will be in for a surprise or two. Okay, good, and, and we'll, you know, we'll mention, and we'll come back to that towards the end of our interview, but I, I thought what I would do today is, is talk to you a little bit about, you know, something that is, uh, in my wheelhouse as well, which is the power of of storytelling uh, and creativity. And you know, the first thing that 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 I noticed is that this is appointment viewing. It's being released on a weekly basis, and it seems like the world has shifted towards this idea of uh, release the entire series at once uh, and then binge watch it or watch it on demand. What are your thoughts and feelings about which style you prefer? Um, you know, kind of every week or all at once? You know, it is sort of on a show by show basis for me as a consumer. There are shows that uh, I like, like for instance, The Last Dance, uh, the, the Jordan documentary that just came out. I liked waiting uh, and not having this obligation of 10 things waiting there for me and feeling like, oh, I got to slog through. Um, but on the flip side, for, for shows like mine, for example, I would sort of compare my show to, uh, to shows like Broad Church or True Detective. And, um, you know, while I don't necessarily consume them all in one sitting, I do like the, the, the choice that I could make to binge a few in a row. So, but I know that's not how Apple, Apple does it. And that's what I knew going into it is they have a, a model that they believe in, which is to put out three at once and then go week by week after that. Their, their philosophy behind that is that three is a good number to get someone to really invest and to say, well, I don't need to watch these three in a row, but over the course of that first week, I can watch three. And then they do want to go week by week, I think in part to you know, spur conversation and have people talking about the show and uh, sort of building up awareness. You know, they're not Netflix. They don't have this massive library of content. They're starting out, and so they do rely a lot on word of mouth. I think Defending Jacob, for example, has seen its viewership grow and grow and grow, and I think if we had dropped them all at once, I'm not so sure they would have necessarily gotten that same kind of traction. So that, that's their philosophy. And, and if, if anything, actually the format, I think, worked while people are in quarantine because there was something to look forward to um and at least i don't know about you but it seems like every day is friday for me i'm like what is friday again so so i think that might have actually played um you know into your hands in a good way in this particular case it's true i, I definitely think people who would ordinarily be out on a friday night um have been making an appointment to watch this with their spouse or their girlfriend or boyfriend or loved ones 
And um, it's become a, I mean, I see it on Twitter, for example, and I even hear it from the folks at Apple that Friday is a big day for the show and people really look forward to, um, to getting together and watching it that way. And I do think if it was just put out as one big, you know, block of episodes, you could binge at your leisure, it wouldn't have had that same effect. The truth is, even if we wanted to have it be dropped all at once and bingeable, we couldn't do it because the virus and the way it hit, um, we weren't ready. Like we we were able to get the first three episodes out and then we've been scrambling week to week to do what's called subbing and dubbing, which is subtitles. And for some countries they need it dubbed. And so even the last episode, that, that's just been completed now uh, for a lot of countries that don't uh, you know, speak English. And so we mm. had the choice, but a lot of times people were saying in the beginning, oh, can't they change their model for this? Everybody wants it all now. People are stuck at home. Can't they just release all eight? And the, tr the truth is, even if we wanted to, we couldn't do it. Well, I think, you know, as I was saying, I think it worked. And you alluded to um, what it is to work in this age of COVID. And, and, and I wonder what have some of the challenges been about being able to keep uh, maybe not production but post-production and and where do you see it heading um in terms of of being able to get back to work and and still be able to create content because we need it right we we need to be entertained we need to escape we need you guys yeah well i mean there's a couple of answers to that in terms of post-production my show is very lucky in that the real hands-on you know a lot of people in a room together work we had wrapped uh, I'm not exaggerating, maybe three days before everyone went into lockdown. Wow. That means like being on a mixing stage and, uh, you know, everyone needs to be present and hearing it through speakers and you can't do it through your computers in, in everybody's office. Um, but a lot of this other stuff, which is more remote work, we were able to have people doing, some people did do them, for, do these jobs from office locations, but they were able to be one person in a room or maybe one person in a room and another person in the room right next to them. It was isolated enough. Um, we got very lucky. Uh, there are shows that I, I have friends, one friend who's a showrunner, her show uh, had to shut down. They weren't ready to complete post-production and there was too many elements that were still in play that they couldn't, they couldn't maintain, so they just shut down. I have a, another friend who was directing a pretty big movie who the whole, they were really only a third of the way through production. That whole production shut down. They were overseas. Everybody had to come home. They're in a holding pattern and don't know when they're going to get up and running again. But on the flip side, a lot of my, uh, my colleagues have been making use of this time in different ways, like doing a lot of pre-production on things that are coming down the line. Um, for instance, that friend of mine whose show got put into pause in post-production uh, they also wanted to do some reshooting. So she's able to really plan those reshoots with a lot more attention than she might have been able to do. Everyone's anxious to get back to work. And I do think people are looking for ways um, to do it safely. And I think some productions, if, they're, if they don't involve massive crowd scenes and uh, you know, there's ways to sort of slowly get back. I think one of the studios, studios I don't want to misspeak, I believe it is Paramount, one of them announced that they're going to start doing production on the lot in a very regimented, safe way. And I think that'll be the canary in the coal mine for everybody else to see how possible it is. But, you know, a lot of these companies had had shows in the in the pipeline that they sort of rushed out, you know, that maybe would have been delayed to the fall or so you haven't seen a complete lag in new stuff being released to, to the viewers. But um, I think we're going to feel it a little bit heading into the summer and the fall where stuff is going to, you're used to more stuff coming out and you're going to feel a little bit, a really vacuous but interesting example would be The Bachelor where they had to suspend uh, production on a show like that where you just can't have all these people living in a house together and competing and Bachelor is so used to cranking out these season after season. It's a big cash cow for ABC and now they're doing a retrospective season of all the best seasons of The Bachelor up to this point. So they're sort of scrambling. Um, it's an interesting time. And I know for me, I've been quite busy. I, I, a lot of people call me up and say, do you have time to look at this book? We think there's something here. There's a lot of work for writers and people who are in the mm -hmm. planning stages of making things. Um, but a lot of people who are editors and uh, certainly people who are in production, like cinematographers and directors, they're all in a holding pattern. I think in the case maybe of The Bachelor, it might be a good thing if we don't oh, see oh, it. Oh, don't say that. 
<laughs> my family uh, bachelor fans, which is why I'm able to speak with such fluency about it. However, uh, uh, it's a it's a true it's a <laughs> guilty pleasure. But uh, well, yeah. then, well, listen, if you if if you dug around and found out a little bit about me, you will find out that that there was my bravado because I'm a huge bachelor there fan you know, as well. So you know, in Bachelor in Paradise, the more schlocky it is, the better. I love um, Bachelor in Paradise, but I mean that's a great example where uh, it's funny. Uh, like my kids and I really love Bachelor so much. We're watching Listen to Your Heart, you know, which is the music version of The Bachelor, and it, the ratings apparently are not very good. And we were joking, like, how do you screw up ratings during everyone's trapped in their house? Um, and I'm sure that the folks at Bachelor are panicking a bit. But this was going to be the thing that would sort of keep Bachelor on life support during this time. So we think about Bachelor way too much in this house. It's embarrassing that. You know, um, just a few little comments have come in. Uh, Faith actually said she's living for that jacket, very dapper. So at least, you know, I, I would have thought it would have been my mom who would have said that, who's watching as well. Mm -hmm. Hi, mom. And uh, just a little shout out to Jamie Thompson, who uh, I think is responding to my little seated uh, soliloquy. I'm almost nervous to ask you what you thought of that, Mark, because uh, I don't know if I can handle the criticism. Um, uh, I thought it was, you know, I thought it was very well done. I'll be honest, something, there was a sync issue in the middle of it, and I got a little distracted by the fact that your mouth was not in sync with your words, so I lost the thread a bit, but I thought it was quite effective. I, I give you kudos on that. Yeah, thank you. Thank, well, that means a lot to me. Well, the, you know, as we were saying before, before you came on, which is technical issues, uh, are probably going to arise. And you're like, Joe, <laughs> have you watched television lately? Have you seen CNN when Fauci is all pixelated and looks like a cyborg? But um, thank you. I, I appreciate that. You know, Mark, um, in my business, in the marketing business, uh, there's a saying which no doubt is even more true in yours, which is content is king. And, and I think that, um, you know, great content will always rise uh, to the top. The cream always rises to the top. Even if you look at now Apple TV+, Plus whether it's the morning show, whether it's defending Jacob, um, the anchor tenants are starting to show themselves and help to you know, be the rising tide that floats all boats. So I wanted to ask your thoughts about how do you believe or how do you see storytelling itself changing? You know, In this day and age of all of this technology and digital distraction and attention fragmentation, how has storytelling changed or, or, or even has it changed fundamentally? I mean, I guess in some sense, it, it's never really going to change. I'm not a video gamer, so I don't really have any insights into the way people consume stories through video games. But I know I hear from a lot of my colleagues who are gamers and who are looking to develop some of these games into films and television, you realize they bump up against the problem that um, ultimately these things want to be shaped into the way that we consume stories and have consumed stories for centuries. Um, which is in the simplest terms, something, you know, with screenwriting, we call the three act structure, which is uh, the first act is your hero uh, is put in a tree. The second act is you're throwing rocks at the hero. And the third act is the hero has to find a way to come down. And that sort of very elemental way of telling a story, you'll see it in everything you watch. You see it in documentaries, you see it in Tiger King, you see it in anything you're watching is this, um, is this basic storytelling shape, which I think, Obviously, there's always people who are breaking those rules, but in large part, I don't think you see a lot of changes in that. However, I think Tibet and Jacob is an interesting show to look at to see how things have changed. Um, I think 30 years ago, this book would have been a movie starring Harrison Ford. It would have been inconceivable to make an eight hour version of this story. And I think now this would be a movie that would feel strange. You wouldn't go to the multiplex to see a movie about this topic. You might see it on Netflix, but it wouldn't necessarily even star big movie stars. In a weird way, the prestige version of this story is to tell it in a more novelistic seven or eight hour way with really recognizable, super talented actors who want this chance to tell these stories in this format. You know, I, I know while working on the show, like to an actor, people would come up to me and say, oh my God, I love working on the scene. In the movie version, we would never have the scene. This would be the first thing they would say. We don't have time for this sidebar between these two characters. This is just about their relationship. It's not about the plot. And I, you know, for movies that are, are genre, right, which this is, this is the legal thriller, um, but movies that are genre, there's such a burden on the plot to keep being propulsive that everything else that doesn't service that ultimately falls by the wayside. 
And th not to say this wouldn't have made a fine film, it probably would have, but it, I think it's a more enriched, an enriched version of itself when you tell it in this style that mimics the experience of when you read a good book. You know, you, it's more immersive. I think you have a more subjective experience with the characters themselves. I think you give yourself time to sort of think about the human drama. And to me, that was certainly the appeal of it was um, I could write the movie version of this in some ways more easily because I have more experience doing that. But um, writing this where I'm sort of walking this tightrope between thriller and keeping people on the edge of their seat, ideally, but also really doing a deeper dive into what does it mean to be a parent, to be a spouse, uh, to be a person. Um, that to me is this, we're in this very unique time in the history of the moving image, right? Not certainly in the history of storytelling, but in the history of film slash TV, where, uh, and I, I credit, you know, everyone has their different touchstones. The Sopranos is probably the first thing that you could really point to and say, wow, that that is like a really massive novel that somehow is being written as you're watching it. And then for me personally, I think the first season of True Detective was the next iteration of how do you tell stories this way? And I know for me, it was a revelation. Like I just was suddenly like, I wanna work in that medium in some ways more than I wanna work in film. The idea of something being two hours now feels almost arbitrary. And I wish it was longer or could be longer. And you see this, and, and so people begrudge the death of movies and I do too sometimes. Uh, certainly the idea that you're gonna to go to the movies with your kids or your wife and you're gonna get popcorn. It's gonna be this outing that we all have nostalgia for. And I'll feel nostalgic for it. However, I would be insincere to say that that I think is the pinnacle of storytelling because I think really in the last 10, 15 years, we've achieved this new plateau where you're seeing just fantastic content come out that there is no cinematic equivalent. Like I can't think of a cinematic equivalent to watching the Sopranos for three years and then Tony and Carmela get divorced, right? You could watch a film, no matter how great the film is, in 45 minutes of storytelling time, you're not gonna have the same emotional resonance than you would with spending that much time with these characters. And likewise, something like Mad Men or, uh, or The Wire, you know, there's no movie version of The Wire. And I don't think um, you would be able to stomach that version because you'd sit in a the theater exhausted. You know, there's something about spending that, it is, the closest sensation is when you have a great book and you lose yourself to this book. And sometimes you're gonna sit there for four hours and sometimes you only have a half an hour, but you're never not thinking about it. Mm. It's a good people like me, you know, right? We, 20 years ago, this wasn't an option. So that's a very long winded answer to the state of storytelling as I, I see it. No, there was so much that I wanted to follow up on, but before I do, I just want to let you guys know that, um, that Mark has very kindly agreed to, I'm calling it a mini masterclass because it seems everyone's doing a masterclass, but afterwards we're gonna do a little after show today uh, in our Zoom room, it's bits.ly slash Corona TV after show. Uh, and Mark's gonna talk about the importance of casting because in this case, you spoke about Harrison Ford, we've got Chris Evans in, in, in this one as well. So thank you for agreeing to do that. Um, Mark, just a comment on what you said and then a follow up question. So the comment is, you know, we, we saw the launch of this new ser service or solution called Quibi, mm. where almost like current TV, you know, Al Gore's network, it seems like there's a move to go shorter and almost feed into this, uh, I call it MDD, media deficit disorder, as opposed to ADD, that these at attention spans are getting shorter. But your comment is, is the exact opposite, which I love, which is, no, no, no extend it, tell different stories, richer stories over time. So I just think that's kind of interesting how they chose one path and it seems like you're moving in the opposite direction, you know, and, and they're struggling because I guess they're, you know, th they've created something that is candy and maybe we don't want candy to rot our teeth. We want something a little bit more I nutritious. I don't know anyone involved in Quibi. I have a friend or two who created content for, Quib for Quibi. But I will say they, in their nominal defense, uh, they could not have launched at a worse time in the history of, of the planet. Um, certainly the history of the sure. uh, Because the whole idea behind Quibi is, oh, I'm waiting at the dentist's office and they're telling me it's another 10 minutes. Let me watch this little show here. And it launched when everybody is in their homes and has no need to digest things in a very quick, you know, they, they, they envision people on subways and again, in waiting rooms and, 
Uh, and that's why initially Quibi wasn't even allowing you to watch it on your television. You were only allowed to watch it on your phone. Mm. And then they changed up that model, seeing that nobody was interested in doing this now because of the quarantine. That said, you know, I don't, I watched a couple of things on Quibi. One thing I thought was great, uh, which is a chef named Evan Funky, who has a restaurant in LA uh, called Felix. It's a pasta restaurant and he does this pasta tour. And it made me realize how much filler is in a lot of half an hour Food Network shows. This was a 10 minute deep dive into what it means to make pasta in different regions of Italy. It's all I wanted was 10 minutes of it, right? But I've tried to watch other things in there, which I'm not gonna name because I don't wanna slam anybody, but when they're fiction and their drama, and it seems almost arbitrary that they're just stopping them at the 10 minute mark, um, then it's a little bit bizarre. And I do think that is, uh, I think they're realizing there's a, a bump in that in that methodology and that they're gonna have mm. to address. Well, wonder what's gonna happen with it. Well, I'll tell you something that, uh, and it goes back to the a platform that you aligned with, which is Apple TV Plus. Um, Apple, Apple released a, a one year free subscription and I was like, you know what? I, I don't need another platform in my life. I'm happy with Netflix. I'm happy, et cetera, and Hulu. And, and I was like, well, it's free for a year. What can I lose? You know, <laughs> got nothing to yeah. lose. And I think that was really smart of them to do because they're, because they're playing the long game. And I think there's still time, by the way, for what it's worth, for Quibi to do that, which is just to give it away free, the try before you buy sampling. And, and, and if they do that, I think more people are going to be able to try it out. But but Mark, I want to just get back to um, defending Jacob, and 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 I have the the trailer. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the full two and a half minute trailer. I will give you two and a half minutes, and I just hope YouTube doesn't ding me for it. And if if YouTube if YouTube does, I'll say I know Mark Bombeck. Um, but I wanted to ask you a, a quick question, which is, there's always the saying because because I love the analogy between you know we we've, we've almost compared and contrast uh, shorter form versus versus movies. But when people look at the book versus the movie or the book versus the television series, there's this saying, which is, it's never quite as good as the book. W what does that mean and why is that the case? Or more importantly, how do you go about telling the story now, this beautiful sight, sound and motion story, recognizing that the book does different things to what, to what your art and your storytelling ability gives you the ability to do? Well, uh, I would say first off, that is, that is obviously a saying you hear all the time. I, I do think it's a bit of a generalization. I think if you look at some of the the sort of touchstones of modern cinema, they're based on, like The Godfather is based on a book. I don't I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who would tell you the book is better than the film or even something like Forrest Gump. I mean, there's a million films that people adore that had their infancy as, as books. Um, so I think it's a bit of an unfair thing, but I know everybody comes in with that assumption. I know for me, and everybody has their own approach. For me, I feel my obligation to the source material is to try to mimic the sensation I had while reading it. And I don't need to be very faithful to it on a scene by scene or certainly line by line basis. And because um, it's the person who wrote that book didn't have the same agenda that I did. They the, the reason I love doing adaptations, like I did an adaptation of a film that came out last year, The Art of Racing in the Rain. There are people who love that book who I'm sure you through a rocket would say the book was better than the film, right? And um, I think what they mean by that is I like the experience of reading the book more than I like the experience of watching the film. What I tried to do was mimic that experience as well as I could. And if I fell short, I fell short. I know other people have told me they enjoyed the film a bit more because there were scenes in the film that felt like um, the, the book had sort of not got, gotten into enough and, and they, they appreciated seeing those scenes come to life, right? I think it depends on what you're bringing to it uh, and how, truthfully, how much you adored the experience of reading a book. But I would never in a million years begrudge someone loving the experience of reading a book. I know I love the experience of reading a book a lot. Usually if there's a book I adore, I won't watch that. Like a great example is a Revolutionary Road, right? That Sam Mendes film that came out with mm. Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet. Like people like that film. That's one of my all-time favorite books of all time. There's no movie that's going to do justice to it. I just know because it speaks to me in a very personal way. So I don't, I don't burden the movie with those expectations. It's not the movie's fault that I had such a powerful connection to the book. Um, but I know there are a lot of people who probably love that movie, and if they read the book, say, eh, I thought the movie was better." So it really is. 
I think the filmmaker's job to be true to the spirit of the book and then not think too hard about people's expectations, book versus movie. It's a sort of a recipe for disaster to sit there and worry. You know, I think the ones, the interesting subset of this whole thing is something like Harry Potter or Hunger Games, where the audiences are demanding a fidelity to the book. That's what they want. If you were to stray too far from those books, people would say, why did you make this film? Like, we, we love these books. We just want to watch it. And we want to see what you see in your mind. But we have a movie in our mind already from watching it. And I think what people enjoy about that experience is the weird intersection between what was in their minds and what the filmmakers had in their heads. But there, those are very different agendas than a book like Art mm. or Defending Jacob, where, you know, Defending Jacob, I'll just sort of pontificate a bit more to say, but Defending Jacob is written in the first person. So you're actually not privy to anything that Chris's character isn't privy to, um, which opens up a ton of scenes that we couldn't possibly have in the book, but are in our show. Uh, and a ton of information about characters that we barely touch on in the book. Um, I know the author himself, when I would pitch him ideas, was getting excited. He liked the idea that I, he had sort of sparked something in me to run with. A tiny example, but a significant one is Michelle Dockery's character, Lori, in the book doesn't have a job. And in our show, her job is a big part of the first half of the show. And it yeah. also informs who she is as a person. I think the author said, gee, it, had I thought of that, I might have explored it. But the truth is, I was telling it from this one character's point of view. I didn't have that agenda. So for someone adapting a book, the, the, the privilege is that the author had one agenda, which was, I want to tell the story the best I can, but I don't need to think about anything other than the book reading experience. And then someone like me comes along and says, all I have to think about is the TV watching experience. I'm going to take the skeleton of a story you have. I'm going to take the ideas that I really liked in here, and I'm going to retell this story to another audience inspired by what you did, but not beholden to what you did, because that's a recipe to have something really flat and actually, again, they're coming at it from a different place. So it's it's a silly thing to try to mimic it too much. It's gonna feel like you're watching an audio book, you know, which is not really what anyone ultimately enjoys. I'll say one last thing. There's a great example of this that is, there's a, not everybody likes this, but there's a book called, uh, a comic book called The Watch, Watchmen, right? It was a great, Fantastic, fantastic graphic novel. And I'm not a comic book guy, but mm. brilliant, brilliant graphic novel. They made a film that was so true to this thing that it's almost, if you look at the panels in the graphic novel and the, the images on the screen, they're almost identical. The yeah. film was really sluggish and very hard to watch because it had too much fidelity. Then Damon Lindelof came, came on and did this HBO version of Watchmen, which is just taking the inspiration from the world there and made a new show. And it's so enjoyable to many people because... It's, they're not doing this apples and orange comparison. They're just watching something new, you know, long-winded answer. But that's that's my take on how you adapt and really what our obligations are as filmmakers. I think it was a terrific response. I almost felt like saying, uh, I can release you from the Zoom after show because you just <laughs> delivered a masterclass. But, you know, you know the I, I love the point you made, Mark, about um, being able to take the feeling that you had when you read the book and translate that. And, you know, in, in, in my business and also when, when I talk to people, I always talk to them about the concept of authentic voice. It's still your voice. It's still the voice, but it expresses itself slightly differently, whether you're, whether you're on television, whether you're writing, whether, whether it's a podcast. And I think it's being able, that is why it's called, I guess, an adapted screenplay. So I loved how you were able to kind of almost walk us through your process and and understand what that journey looks like so thank you for that that was that was awesome it's a very strange sensation when you make things like this especially this which is so long that you do get a real sense of authorship there's a lot of me in the show i'd say my family who knows me quite well recognize a lot of very personal things in that in that show even though it is again inspired by this book i think you know, it's it's what makes me get excited to sit down at my computer every day. Otherwise, I'm just taking dictation from someone else's work. So my job is to sort of use my voice to retell a story that I enjoy. You know? it, it's a real treat, I think, for me and people watching because I am so I'm all in on this and I can't wait for the finale for the series finale. And I think what I'm going to do now uh, and you guys have an opportunity still to watch it and and catch up and be able to share this water cooler event on Friday. But we're gonna end off by hopefully tech willing, 
uh, show you the trailer uh, for uh, for the show. We were sailing towards an iceberg. This little white peak in the distance getting closer and closer. But really, it's been underneath us the whole time. It's nothing worse than a kid. We have some bad news on the case. The print we lifted from the victim is from your son. There's got to be an explanation. They go to the same school, Jacob's in his class. Yes, we know that. Lynn, have you arrested my son? Before we begin, I want to make something clear. A kid your age charged with first-degree murder <laughs> is tried as an adult. I swear, I didn't do it. We believe you. You have admitted to being in the park, and a fellow student alleges you had a knife you would bring to school. I guess so. They're saying he looks smug and remorseless. This is gonna follow him around for the rest of his life. It's a mistake. We're gonna figure it out. Do you have any doubts about Jacob's innocence? No, of course not. Where is the knife now? So you've been lying to me. I did what any parent would have done. You can't leave his fate up to the courtroom. My only job now is trying to protect our son. We're prisoners in our own home. Acting like we're normal. We are normal. Oh my God, do you think this is normal? We gotta get answers for ourselves. I know what you did! Lawyers have boundaries. I don't, not anymore. Remember that in their eyes, it isn't just Jacob who's guilty. You all are. Did you follow me here? This is damaging. This is evidence. You're scaring him. Good, he should be scared. I'm scared. So I have to know. I want the truth. You can be a good man, or you can be a good father. There was no normal to go back to. It was just before and after. Wow. And by, Successfully. by the way, I want yeah. No, I know you there. I wanted you to see that uh, I actually have Newton, uh, Massachusetts, the courthouse in the background. <laughs> That's where I am. This was live on location. I, I forgot to tell you that. Nice. Um, I, I had goosebumps watching it, but I was watching you in, in the green room uh, like a proud father. So that was kind of awesome. I, you know, I haven't watched that trailer uh, since it was released. And, and I actually was thinking, it's funny you should say that, I was thinking about the long road to getting that trailer to where it is because we had a couple of trailers that weren't that successful and um, that was the one I was happiest with. So I was just, I guess, enjoying watching it again. That's funny. All right, well, we are now gonna head over to the Zoom room. I uh, can't wait to hear some of the questions and hear a little bit about casting uh, J.K. Simmons. I mean, you know, just worship the guy and he was pretty scary. Uh, uh, appropriately so, I must say, but yet he revealed that at the end of the day, he was a father, a murdering father, but a father <laughs> nonetheless. I hope I'm not like letting anything go, but um, uh, so I don't think so. Um, so we're gonna head over to bit.ly slash Corona TV after show. Before we do, Mark, um, thank you again for coming in. Um, we always end the show by, by me asking my guests to just give a little bit of advice to people that are at home right now that are maybe a little stuck, a little bit down, just something that's going to brighten their day or give them, um, you know, that little bit of inspiration to keep going. Oh boy, that's a that's actually a big ask. Um, I'll tell, I guess I'll just say, what I say to my children is that there are a lot of people who have it much much worse than you do, and it, it's it's very hard to attain a perspective beyond your own sort of immediate reality, but it's important to try to do that, at least for people who are healthy. Um, you know, my brother and his wife, Knockwood, uh, you know, came through uh, having the virus. We have a neighbor who had it really bad and wound up in the hospital. I have an uncle who had it. And we've been very fortunate that nobody has succumbed to it. Although actually one of my parents' friends did succumb to it. 
Um, but I think, again, if you have your health, it's really important to just try to get outside of your immediate sphere of problems. But also, I think, take it easy on yourself and know that it's okay to feel selfishly grumpy about where you're at and know that's natural, too. I, I'm very against preaching to anyone else how to get through anything. So you're hearing me being very reticent, but that's, uh, I really just had a talk with my daughter about this, <laughs> who, as I said to her, uh, so many people have it so much worse than you. Her response was, but I'm not them, I'm me, which is, you know, again, a very normal reaction that a kid would have. Um, but it's important to try to get past that. Mm. Well, you know what, Mark, I think that was a perfect response. And, and Faith said, love that, keep it all, uh, keep it all in perspective. And Faith actually lost her father a few weeks ago um, at the hands of COVID-19. Um, so we're, we're all connected and I do appreciate you sharing some of those words. Um, so Mark, thank you. You can head over to the Zoom room uh, at your leisure. Um, thanks again for coming in. Wow, that was amazing. Um, and uh, I hope you appreciated that. Make sure that you watch uh, Defending Jacob on Friday. Uh, well, Friday is the finale, uh, but get up to speed, catch up because it's a terrific, terrific series and and of course you know mark's done a phenomenal job so that's it from me we will return on tuesday although there will be a premiere of the pre-recorded show tomorrow very confusing but just bottom line if you're following me you'll see the show otherwise i'll be back live on tuesday take care, everyone take care of yourselves happy memorial day and we're thinking of uh, the souls of the departed and all of their families during this very trying time bye everyone